Hi everyone, welcome to Happy to See Me. I'm your host, Erica Kasupanen. Most people know me as an underestimated winner of Survivor. And this podcast puts the spotlight on the overlooked and underestimated. Today, I am speaking to John Michael Sosa, aka JM, from this past season of Big Brother Canada. But first, I love to start the episode by sharing something I was happy to see this week. And what I was happy to see was a huge goal. So for the first time, I did a pull-up unassisted. Now, this was a goal I have had for years. I've started working out Ooh, when I moved to Toronto, so maybe 10, 11, 12, I don't even remember how long, years ago. And when I started training with my personal trainer back in 2018, I was thinking one day I would love to be able to do a pull-up. So then that goal became more serious once I hit 2019, and we thought 2020 was going to be the year I would do a pull-up. And then, of course, the world stopped in 2020. I stopped having access to the gym, stopped having access to my trainer in person. And then, you know, that goal, it got delayed a little bit. And then it doesn't help that I went on a reality show and starved and lost all of my muscle. So by the time I came back from filming Survivor, it was like I was at square one of this pull-up goal. But the last two years, I've really worked hard to not only regain the muscle that I lost, but then build more of it and put in that consistent practice. And then, hey, this week with the pull-up bar I bought and hung up in my closet, I was able to do my first unassisted pull-up. So it's just a good reminder to me and hopefully to other folks that you can set a goal and sometimes things will happen out of your control and the timeline will not be what you had in mind, but it's all going to come together perfectly with the right persistence and the right consistency. So if you have a fitness goal, I hope you know that I am rooting for you, but that's what I'm happy to see this week, my unassisted pull-up. Now I'm going to try to do more pull-ups and, you know, have some more upper body related goals. All right, let's get into this week's episode. I am speaking to John Michael from Big Brother Canada. He is a fellow Filipino-Canadian reality TV star. So we really bond in this episode. We talk about the Filipino representation or the lack thereof we saw on TV growing up. And we talk about what it's like being Filipino on reality TV and whether that affected our perception of ourselves in the game, whether it affected the way that we perceived ourselves on the show, and even the way that we are processing our respective experiences now. So there are going to be laughs in this interview. There are going to be heartfelt moments. There's a lot of vulnerability. And honestly, I talk to so many reality TV people, yet I feel like I always get new insight anytime someone comes on this show and is willing to open up their heart to me. So thank you so much, John Michael, for this interview. I think whether or not you're a Big Brother Canada fan, you are going to get something out of this. So let's just get into it. Without further ado, this is my interview with John Michael Sosa. I hope you enjoy it. I was actually an actor. Actually, weirdly enough, I can actually say that I'm an international actor. <laughs> what did you act in? Which country? If you if, In the Philippines. So they um, hired a UK company, hired me, National Geographic, flew me down to the Philippines. And I literally played this like kid who gets kidnapped by a, I'm not even making this up, a kid that gets kidnapped by terrorists and I like escape. Oh my God. And I'm on Disney Plus. Shut up. What's it called? Wait, what is it called? I'm not even kidding. What is it? Wait, tell, tell I'm us not all. Even what kidding. is it called? It's, it's funny. So it's it's called Locked Up Abroad, season 10, episode 11, which is funny because I was a finalist for season 10 of Big Brother Canada, oh. and I made it on for season 11. Yeah. Okay, so 10, 11 is meant to be. Yeah. Actually, so I don't know if you're an astrology girly, but I was I born at 10, 11 a.m. Oh. And my grandma... Her birthday was October 11th. Okay. So I'm like, Very oh, the 10 11s are following. I do make connections with numbers. Like, yeah. I believe in those things. Like, it's like, you know, it's it's hard to believe that people don't believe. I mean, like, you know, 
to each their own. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, yeah, I'm a true Aries though. Like, oh, okay. Aries through and through. Wait, tell me more. I love a natal <laughs> chart. Like, who knows if this will make it into the episode? But I right. love a natal chart. Yeah. Um. I'm so I don't know exactly when I was born. Like, I was born like in the morning, like around 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. So demon hours. So I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> so Everything a, is making sense now. Yep. Perfect. Like, so I'm April 7, so I'm definitely an Aries. I think that there's a, a little bit of Leo and another Aries in there. Like, that's oh, that's what so a lot I've of fire. tried. Yeah. So I've tried every single, like, like um, what's it called? Astro test that you can do, but mm-hmm. they won't give you a specific answer if you don't give them the exact day, yeah. time, and, like, place. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, I know where I was born. Yeah. I just don't know the exact time, and I don't think my mom cares enough to look for my record. You were born in Manila, right? I was, yes. Okay, so on my birth certificate, I was also born in Manila. It says the exact time. So Canadian birth certificates, I believe, don't have the exact time, but in oh. the Philippines, they have it. So we all have to do our duty to be astrology girlies if we know the exact birth time. Okay, okay I'm going to make that my like new mission yeah. to find it because I have like my my citizenship. I don't have my birth certificate. Oh. And I think I asked my mom to look for it, and she couldn't find it, so... Maybe you were never born. Immaculate consent. No, that's not a thing. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're just like that's we, not the same we thing. believe in the stars. We believe in the power of the moon, but immaculate conception. We're like, ooh, ooh we need to think about, about this. We might have to draw the line there. Okay, speaking of your parents, yes, because your parents relate to reality TV. So we're gonna talk about oh reality goodness. TV, being Filipino. I guess loving astrology, but. When you were getting ready for Big Brother Canada, I had seen you were saying that you were a super fan and your parents were super fans. So where are you always reality TV fans? Like what drew this family to reality TV? Goodness. So uh, we first started watching like Big Brother, Big Brother US season five, I think. And we like watched it one day. We all like vibed with it and mm-hmm. we just kept watching every season like literally like we like t every single episode we would even like go as to like skipping fam jams to watch like <laughs> live evictions like is that that's so bad but like also it was just a place for us to just find so much common ground like um I don't know if people knew but like I'm pretty gay and like you know super in a closet when I was younger yeah, yeah. and so it was like You know, when you're growing up queer in general, you're you're always like hiding that part of you because you're scared of whatever, right? Whatever it is you're scared of. I'm not here to invalidate anyone's feelings, but I was hiding a part of me and it made it really difficult for like me to connect with my parents, even my siblings in some ways, you know? Mm -hmm. So watching reality TV, we could just like enjoy something and like talk about it in like in depth too like we weren't sitting there and being like oh my gosh we like loved everybody because we love Janelle because she's one no like we were like no Janelle did this Mm -hmm. and like her our favorite like you know costumes our favorite moves the backstabbing like we talked about it like through and through and like we would even like get to the point where after the episode we'll be eating dinner and we talk about like our own strategies like what would you have done during this like Mm -hmm. competition so it was just part of our lives growing up you know my sisters and and my parents When you got on Big Brother, were they super pumped? Were they like, we have the game plan for you? What was it like leading up to actually filming the show? So leading up into filming of the show, I couldn't tell them. So obviously, like, we have, like, NDAs that we signed, but they were getting, like, some sort of ideas because I started showing up and I started, like, I don't live at home anymore. And I started just showing up, like, oh, let's film stuff for my YouTube channel that doesn't exist anymore, you know? So, um, but when I, when the cast got announced, my parents were so excited, like crying, Mm -hmm. crying. Cause my sister- But you were in quarantine by this point. So they couldn't even celebrate They couldn't even contact me. Yes. My, when the cast got announced, like my uncle tried calling me, my aunt, they're all like freaking out because they're like, oh my gosh, like he made it on Big Brother. And I'm like, I'm like sitting in my like, you know, sequester hotel, just like, getting into the zone, probably watching Survivor, actually, which is funny. (laughs) Uh, You know, just sitting there, like, watching, just, like, getting to the zone um, and not even thinking about it. But, like, we we didn't know. Like, we don't know the days of, right? Like, we weren't told, like, okay, the cast got announced this day. Like, you just don't know. But you can feel, like, the energy. When you're connected Mm -hmm. to people and, like, you know, 
you you can feel the relationships and you can feel the air like just that energy coming through it's like okay i think people know now mm-hmm, it's like mm-hmm. you know so i i felt it in the in the hotel i can't believe you couldn't tell them at all like nope <laughs> so on survivor we have all the ndas as well but my parents and my family and anyone i lived with they could sign an nda so they could at least know where i was going okay. obviously i came home and i couldn't tell them what happened couldn't tell them i won but at least they knew i wasn't just like disappearing for you know it's like all of a sudden I just like get up and leave and it's yeah. like why isn't Erica at the apartment anymore so yeah. at least they knew where I was going I had one person who knew which was my sister mm-hmm. and I made it a choice not to tell them because I wanted to just have them excited because I well you know growing up Filipino your mm-hmm. parents are like all up in your business yes. like it's, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's not a matter yeah. what it is like they're all up in your business and I really just wanted like to do something without them putting their foot in it. I just want them to just enjoy without them feeling like, oh, we did this. Like I wanted to show them like, hey, like this is who I am as a human being now Mm -hmm. that you guys have raised and hopefully you find something that you're proud of (laughs) while being on the show, so. I'm sure they were proud. They elated and yeah, super excited. Like the reaction videos that I got from like the first win, my mom like jumping like for joy. It was like, it was like, so touching but also like heartbreaking considering Mm -hmm. you know my demise yeah but yeah but nothing will take away that moment because I remember watching that challenge too I think that I only watched like two episodes of your season I'll be honest (laughs) I used to love Big Brother Canada but then after having been on reality tv myself I'm like I can only watch so much of it because it hits too close to home but I remember that challenge and I think it's where you guys are going down that spirally net and then you and your partner figure out how to get out I'm like yes my kababayan (laughs) and for those who are not Filipino kababayan is like your cousin or your countryman yes. in, yes. Fi- in the Philippines. Yeah. Yes. So I was like, yes, my kababayan figured it out. Yes. Yeah. I was like so focused. Like even when, you know, when you're filming these shows or these competitions, I mean, you know, like there's so much like waiting involved. So as I'm like waiting there and, you know, like they're waiting to say go, I'm like already studying, like looking at like, okay, how can I do this? How can I do that? So my mind was on fire mm-hmm. in the house, like never ever stopping. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And when I saw that net, I'm like, oh, like that's going to like really throw a wrench in people's plans. Mm-hmm. So I made an effort to like make sure I was like studying it. Like even when the puzzles were going down, I was like trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And the moment Santina fell through that pu- and I whipped that thing, mm-hmm. she slipped right through. Ooh. She slipped right through and I was like, easy. Yeah. Easy. There you go. Use your brains. <laughs> Okay, so you said that there's lots of waiting, so that's something that people don't expect when they go into the house. Aside from the production-y type stuff, what surprised you about the experience of actually being in the house and playing the game after your years and years of watching the show? And I know this can be a weighty question, so we can go any direction you want. Yeah. Uh, I think something that I didn't realize while I was in the house is how immersed you get. Like... I thought, like, watching it, like, so let's talk about watching other seasons. I thought that these guys were, like, you know, performing. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the stuff that I was doing, aside from, like, you know, anytime I was trying to recall something and trying to be funny in, like, a diary room, everything was, like, genuinely me. Mm -hmm. And it was so weird to, like, look back and be like, oh, yeah, like, I did say that. Like, you know, there were things that my family members were even picking up on that were, like, like, oh, that's so funny that you said this and that. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't even realize. Like, it wasn't performative, right? Mm-hmm. So, or performance. And I, that, I think, was, like, this, the craziest part to me. That, like, you know, you go in there, there's a billion cameras everywhere, and then 30 minutes in, you, you forget. Yeah. You're just like, okay, let's do it. You know, it's like your fight or flight kicks in. Mm-hmm. Your heart rate is always at, like, 130 the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> the moments that make TV often are the real ones. So when you say something, you don't realize that that's what you've said. That's usually what makes it. I have observed that there are people who go into these shows and I'm like, oh, you're trying to create a moment here. Yes. You're trying to be iconic. Yes. And it's not, it, you can tell, so yeah. it's not going to go down the way that yeah. you think it is. But yes, it's always those real authentic moments. Right, exactly, exactly. I I didn't know that it was, because you know, you, it's so easy for us to judge, mm-hmm. especially being like a couch player, I call them. Like, you know, when you're sitting on a couch, you've seen so many seasons, you look at it and you go, oh yeah, I could do, I could mm-hmm. do this, I could do that, whatever, right? When you're in there, it's like, 
everything just like you're throwing spaghetti at the wall like mm-hmm. what sticks you know and I think that that the genuinity behind some of those scenes that you see I call them scenes because obviously it's produced but um the things that you saw with my housemates even with myself I'm like whoa these are like real emotions yeah like <laughs> so we didn't meet through reality TV necessarily for we everyone to know. We met at a birthday party. Yes, yes, like, I didn't know that we were cousins. Like truly as organic as it could. Yeah, I know that now we're <laughs> long lost cousins. And then, yeah, then we just like kept hanging out and seeing each other. And now exactly. here we are today. And what's interesting is something I had read that you had said before you filmed the show is one of your fears was being able to connect with people. Yes. So... In my time of knowing you, it doesn't seem like that would be a problem for you. <laughs> but where did this fear come from? I, I think it really does like root back to like being a immigrant like that came here. I was surrounded by people who didn't look like me. Mm-hmm. And so it really terrified me like, you know, growing up and just every stage of my life has always been a little bit of a challenge of like, how do I connect with people who don't understand my culture? Who because, you know, like. Um, I am not, like, m- the Filipino culture in my household is so celebrated. Like, my parents mm-hmm. speak Tagalog all the time and, like, speak to us in it. Even my Lolo and Lola who brought us up growing up, we, you know, they spoke to us in that. And do you speak and- Tagalog? I do. I Good do. Good for you. Marunong mag Tagalog. So... Yeah. <laughs> Maganda. Um, wow. <laughs> My Tagalog sounds like it's a North American Valley girl speaking Tagalog, mm-hmm. but I understand. Yeah, it's okay. You know, Tagalish is really fun. <laughs> I find I find that like when, um, have you ever like tried singing in Tagalog? I feel. No. Oh, when you sing in Tagalog, it feels so like, like warm and comforting. Like it feels so correct in mm-hmm. so many different ways. It's so weird. But yes, I've been listening to like. Christmas music in Tagalog right now and like <laughs> it's getting me in the Christmas spirit so let's go yes. and Philippines loves Christmas loves it yeah like fireworks firecrackers mm-hmm. it is like it is like Mardi Gras mm-hmm. on on steroids over there yes. yeah and I still remember those moments because I I lived there for the first like five years of my life you know I know I'm 21 and um <laughs> <laughs> I'm 29. I'm 29. (laughs) Um, But yes, uh, going back to the question at hand, it was just, it it was always like something internalized, you know, like Mm -hmm. even like the media that we consumed, like how often did you see someone that looked like you? um, Never. Right. Literally. Mm -hmm. I cannot even think of like one iconic like Disney show Mm -hmm. that we laugh at and recall on like TikTok and social media None of those people look like me at all. Mm-hmm. And if they did, they played like a side character that yeah. was supposed to be funny or like they're super jaded or like super like something. They were just never, they just never existed. Yeah. And that like really played into this, like, how do I connect with people and how do I do this and do that? And, you know, so going into the house, that was like my biggest fear. Mm-hmm. But lo and behold, it was actually uh, one of the reasons why I left the house so soon because I connected with people so well that they were like, oh, like this guy has a social game. Like he just won the first comp. Like we're looking at a possible triple threat. And then I put that puzzle together like a breeze and everyone's like, oh, and he's good with puzzles. I'm like, okay, well. It's funny how, of course, yes, you're very talented and obviously you did so well at that challenge. But it's just so funny how it's like you can show some skill or I guess some extra I don't know I don't, yeah I guess it's like I guess some extra skill in yeah. certain areas and people would be so quick to say okay huge threat right when I think right. if other people demonstrated the Absolutely. same ability they perhaps would not have had the word threat immediately put on that 100 percent like before even being put up on the block, so a back door, you know, um, for for those that have never heard of the idea of a back door is that you are removing someone, um, you're placing someone as a nominee without the opportunity of removing themselves off. So that's the idea of a back door, mm-hmm. you know, plan. And <clears throat> before that even happened, we saw people like Dan perform like exquisitely well in a endurance slash physical comp and he wasn't looked at as a threat like I was like I'm like five foot I'm like pushing five foot five Mm -hmm. like five foot six like I'm not not the tallest boy in that I was not the tallest boy in that house and you know it was I was still labeled as like 
more of a threat than he was. And I was like really confused. And I love Dan. I love my castmates. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want anyone thinking that I'm bitter, but like it really did play into this idea of like, oh my gosh, like when you are like different in any way, mm -hmm. in any way, and you could, you know, label it whatever you want, whether you're queer or POC. Um, you might have a disability that you work with. Like when you are different, you show some like level of strength. Mm -hmm. People will always look at that as a threat. It's like, wait a second. Like you're, you know, especially being queer and Asian, like there's this like stigma and stereotype that I need to fit. Like mm -hmm. I need to be submissive and I need yeah. to be like, you know, you had a um, you had a guest that talked about in Asian culture, we're supposed to be like, you know, the yes men, like anything that happens in the household, it's like, it's like we do it and if we don't do it, there's like punishment mm -hmm. and we're supposed to act that way, you know, but I never grew up like that. I was so strong headed and like stubborn, mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. all the things that I'm not supposed to be. And so I have always faced that adversity in like my dating life, in like um, cor the corporate world, in anything. It's so weird, but mm -hmm. it's like. You know, I don't sit here and go, woe is me. Like, I don't want anyone thinking, like, I want sympathy. No, actually, like, I look at that and I remind myself to, you know, keep pushing and just be myself. Yeah. You know, and that's why, like, you will never, ever, should I ever, ever have an opportunity to be back in a game. I will never play, like, you know, I will never play down myself. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that the reason why pe so many people resonated with me was I was just, like, being genuine like yeah this is who I am I know that there's a game to play and I probably may have made it a little further if I pretended to be like oh I don't know what's going on and all these things mm -hmm. but um at the end of the day what I cherish the most about this experience is the connections that I made mm -hmm. you know the dms that flooded like talking about like thank you for representing blank and I'm just like whoa I didn't even think that like that was what was gonna happen but it was like one of the joyous like surprises that came out of this whole experience for me. It's not just the win as in the title that is the win from the experience. And I know that if I was to say that previously, people would be like, that's really rich coming from you because you won the game. But I have now been a first boot too. Oh yeah, so, first boot sister. First boot sister. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the full experience. So yep, I can did. say that you can win even though you are not the winner. 100%. And what you were saying before, this is why we say it all the time, but representation matters because when you grow up and the only people who are like you that you see and other people see are the sidekicks or the characters who don't have a lot of agency or they're not there to push the story forward, that's how people view people like you. And then it's confusing when it's like, oh, he's not being submissive. He actually yeah. has a mind of his own or Absolutely. he's not being a yes person and he's, and he's actually able to build connections. And there's something about how that who you are doesn't fit into the perception that makes people uncomfortable. But I'm like, hey, that's their own thing. Keep right. going. And you have to keep showing people yeah. that you are you and there are other people who are themselves. And that's how we have a better understanding of each other. So then knowing all of this, so knowing that in many ways you you feel like perhaps you're the underdog. You're a Filipino immigrant, 5'5 five, five on a good day. 5'6 <laughs> five, six on, five, six on a good day. 5'6 in the right shoes. In the right shoes, yes. <laughs> and then also um, a queer man. I am. Were you very aware of all of this going into the house and the potential representation? Like how much of a role did that play? I, so I didn't go in thinking, like, I must represent my people. Like, mm -hmm. I think that that's, like, I don't think that ever, you know, is something that I, like, meditated on. But, like, walking in, I, if you watch anything pre-game, I'm talking about, like, how I want to play a certain type of role to, like, try to get myself further, all these things. But something, like, transformative happens when those doors open and you walk in and you're, like, Oh my gosh and I thought to myself like if I pretend to be someone I'm not and I get first boot I'm going to regret that for the rest of mm -hmm. my life but if I'm myself and I still get evicted first at least I can like sit on the fact that I was genuinely me and if people found that threatening then people found that threatening mm -hmm. and you know I'm so happy that I made that choice but in moments where I could have exploded where I could have called people out where I could have like just been so malicious and so vicious and so like Twitter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
I thought to myself, I'm like, my parents are watching this. I never really thought of like, oh, the Filipino community who's watching this, the queer community. I just thought like, if I was watching me right now and I just got backdoored and I saw myself react poorly, mm -hmm. it, would, it wouldn't make me feel comfortable. Like it wouldn't make me happy. So yeah. in, in JM fashion, I just silently walked away. Yeah. <laughs> like, it just like didn't <laughs> say you. anything to them. And I think that m made people feel way worse than me like <laughs> freaking out, you know? Yeah. Like, cause even in that house, when I walked into the bedroom and I actually had laundry. So like, it felt so surreal to me, like this was happening. Cause you don't, you try not to manifest these things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when you have a feeling something's about to happen, mm -hmm. but you don't talk about it, but it's in there. Yeah. Because yeah. if I, I, I'm a true believer, I don't know about you, but like, if you say it, mm -hmm. you're putting power to it, whatever yeah. you're talking about, right? So even in moments where I thought I was getting backdoored, I didn't talk about it because I'm like, Oh, I don't want like yeah, any. You don't speak it into right. reality. Exactly. Yeah. Don't speak it into existence. Yeah. But I had a feeling. And so I still I was still trying to put the groundwork. I was still trying to figure it out. But when it finally happened, I was like actually like confused. I was like, how is this even possible? Like I I have given like my game to the HOH at that point. Like this is someone I wanted to work with. Like I was in a daze. Mm -hmm. And and I remembered that I had laundry that I had taken out of <laughs> the dryer yeah. before the nomination ceremony. And I was like, I'm going to go do my laundry. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just like really like I was like I was happy like and I do this now too like mm -hmm. where it, if ever I'm like in a spiral or feeling like I can't grasp anything I'm like what's something tangible I could do right now to ground me. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing laundry and every time someone walked into the room to comfort me they're like oh my gosh are you packing? And I'm like no I'm, I'm just here doing laundry you yeah. know. So going into the house I don't, I didn't meditate on like, I have to represent people, all this, like, you know, I, I appreciate that people saw something in me mm -hmm. that made them feel something and feel represented in some type of way. But when it came in, when it came to the game and being in there, I was, I was mindful of the things that I was saying, the way, the way that I was acting so that, you know, I think more so like my parents don't look at me and go, we didn't we didn't teach him that like we yeah, didn't we yeah. didn't raise him that way you know why mm -hmm. is he acting that way so i think i think it would have been good drama like i think it would have been good <laughs> tv if i freaked out i mean like anyone who's seen like my twitter fingers now like they, <laughs> they know like how how spicy i can be yeah. and how out of pocket i could be but at the end of the day i think the the right choices were made um by past jam and whoever he was mm -hmm. thank god like that yeah. i thank him for for just reacting the way that he did because yeah. I think that it makes me proud to like look back and say okay I didn't really go nuts in that house <laughs> mm. I'm sure your parents are proud you made so many people proud I yes. think even the first thing I said to you when I met you was oh my gosh you wore a barang yes which if people don't know a barang is traditional Filipino formal wear but you wore a barang when you got eliminated I remember seeing that I'm like sick that's I like did. so cool it was like I was actually my finale look and yeah. I actually um I borrowed it from my dad because I told him that I was like going somewhere and I'm like, can I borrow your barong? And his is like an authentic one made in the Philippines mm -hmm. like from 10 years ago. So there's just like history behind it. And I've always liked to thought to myself, I'm like, if I'm ever like feeling like I'm leaving the house, I'm going to wear that. Mm -hmm. So I, and I told that to my sister. I'm like, if I'm wearing this, you'll know I'm going home. And she's like, Oh, no. <laughs> As I'm like saying bye to her going yeah. into sequester. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, speaking of you going home, I know that you were more concerned with just being true to yourself. Unfortunately, with you going home early, you have become part of a really unfortunate pattern that we've seen in Big Brother Canada where you are now the third first boot in a row who has been a queer Asian person. Yes. So was that something that you were aware of immediately when you were going? In the house, like, I I put two and two together. Like, it did feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I just really didn't want to be the, the you know, the boy that cried wolf. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't necessarily think it would have been fair to be like, guys, I'm like the third yeah. person going home. Like, I really don't think there's like, you know, um, 
in some ways I felt like that would have been like really dirty just like mm-hmm. leveraging my differences yeah, so I can yeah. stay is like oh it makes me feel like gives me the ick a little bit mm-hmm. but yeah it was a pattern I think that it needs to be broken like season 12 they we need to do better yeah we need to yeah, do better yeah and and I think it's it's not about the type of person who's going home like I, I know that I feel like I didn't deserve to go home mm-hmm. and, and it, everyone's going to feel that way, right? Regardless yeah. of how far in the journey you are. I'm sure people who placed second believe that they should have won, right? But it's the principle. It's the precedent. It's the it's the precedence that we are setting yeah. in reality TV that it's okay to send home people of color, uh, people who are queer first mm-hmm. because of blank. Like, I think I think it would have been really different if I made major mistakes, like such as, you know, running my mouth the entire time. But I think if you ask 10, like, actually, let's just talk about my house guests. If you ask all 15 of them, why did JM go home first? You're going to get 15 different answers. Mm -hmm. Right. But the ultimate truth behind like going home first was that I was looked at as a threat. I was an easy target Mm -hmm. because of like just yeah it's it's still I've healed from the situation but it's still like hard to like is this really like what life is it's like a little microcosm cosmic you know world that we live in in that house it's like is that really what we are coming down to but I mean, at the end of the day, I'm going to choose to believe that the reason I went home was because they thought I was a threat mm-hmm. and not because of anything else. But it doesn't, it definitely, I definitely side eye the, uh, you know, patterns that come yeah. out of these reality TV shows now. Like, Canada, we got to do better. <laughs> and I want to make it clear, no one is accusing anybody of anything. Exactly. I can say like with my whole heart, I don't believe there's a single person on those last three seasons who was like, I'm going to do this because I feel this type of way about this group. I do not believe that at all. I don't think that there's any conscious action. There's any negative intent here. I think that it's just unfortunate that this is the pattern and it sucks. I can imagine how much it sucks when this is your dream and you're like, oh, I have unfortunately become another person on this pattern. And it's yeah, like, nobody wants to- Yeah, I become a statistic. To, yeah. And it's like, uh, what? No. Like I was, and I, and that's always one thing that I really wanted to break. I wanted to break that curse. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, that is one thing that I meditated on. I'm like, I can't be the first. Like, I can't be the first. Like, I tried to. And I even like purposefully- like connected with the other Asian contestant in my house <laughs> to like, you know, it, you know, if you're thinking about it, the person you team up with is the person that's going to trust you the most. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, powers that be came in and, mm-hmm. you know, swayed those numbers and <sighs> by a vote of 11 to zero and zero. Oh, John Michael, no. you were evicted from the Big Brother house. Do those words just sear they into your brain? Do they show haunt, up in your nightmares? They haunt me. Like, Jeez. I I have a Discord community, and I have, like, a little sound bite of it. Yeah. Just so that I can, like, it brings me back down to earth. Like, yeah. Arissa saying, John Michael, I'm sorry, John Michael, but you've been evicted. I'm just like, yeah. So anytime you see me, like, popping off, just, like, play that part. And I'll be like, okay. Oh, then you calm right down? And yeah, literally. I'm like, You're like okay, the dog I'm back. that goes back to, into its Exactly. Yeah. I'm like, okay, <laughs> Right, right, right. Humble, humble. It was a humbling <laughs> experience. I, you know, I pride myself in being a strong individual, independent. But what I choose to pick or and and learn from these experiences is like, don't forget to be humble. You know, mm-hmm. like I, it's so weird. Like when I first met you, I. So my confession, when it comes to like reality TV and like being in this space now, because it's like it's like when people say like, oh, you're a celebrity, and I'm just like, no, I'm not. Like, Mm -hmm. that's weird. That's weird to say. Stop saying that. (laughs) Um, But being in the presence of, like, you know, an actual winner. And, like, when I first met you, I didn't know that you won. I didn't know that you had such a, one, big following. Like, I didn't know all these things because you had just such a, like, warm and humbling aura about you. And I'm like, I'm going to be that. Like, that's, like, because then I looked you up and I was like, wait a (laughs) second. (laughs) Wait a second. Or even, like, Fierce. When I first met Fierce, like, I have never seen Fierce out of drag, okay? So Mm -hmm. I know who Fierce was. I've already been following them. And when I first met Fierce, I was like, 
And then I, after the fact, looking them up, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> these are like, like actual famous people. So it's, it, it's no. <laughs> you know, in, in all of this, I, I like just remember to be humble, like choose yeah. to like take and learn from it, right? Like, yes, be bitter and feel all of the feelings and don't let people uh, take away from how you felt in the moment and what you take away from it now. But it's so, so, so important to learn something yeah if you don't yeah. learn something from doing reality tv then Ooh, then you're probably gonna keep going back to reality tv as like a villain or something <laughs> yeah oh my gosh <laughs> uh, imagine me a villain though i mean who knows if you just like allow yourself to pop off next time it could happen yeah <laughs> i mean hopefully there's a next time producers i'm just kidding Hello. <laughs> I think that people underestimate, unless honestly listeners to this podcast now understand, because I talk to so many reality TV people yes. and we're, everyone is healing in some way. Mm -hmm. Everyone, no matter if they've been the first boot or they've been the winner, there's been a level of people feeling jaded. There's been a level of bitterness. There's yeah. been a level of people being hurt. And everybody goes on this journey to try to heal. If if you are grounded and you are healthy and you want to heal, because also some people, I think, just want to revel in it and keep Absolutely. spiraling and that that's their journey. What was it like for you to then heal and learn something after the show? Ooh, that is a really good, really, really good question. Like, how much time do we have during this session? <laughs> because um, my healing journey, like, first off, like, I am so oblivious to, like, being mistreated mm -hmm. like I didn't know so I you know when I walked out like my journey okay so the moment I walked out I was taking everything with like grace I was doing all of my PR and all of my um post interviews and podcasts and I was like oh my gosh I like love my friends and blah 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 you know having a good time and then I didn't watch the episodes until the week after I got eliminated because my mom's birthday was that week. So she had all of our family and people who um, who supported me in my journey there mm -hmm. at her house. So I showed up um, and we had this brilliant idea to like watch the six episodes that I was on. And I'm like, OK, let's do it. I mean, it's the best time to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you're surrounded with so much love and support. May as well. Like, I probably would not have survived if I watched it by myself. Yeah. So I did watch it. And suddenly all of this like feeling of like gratefulness and like serenity yeah. of like peace that I had like turned into bitterness. Like yeah. I saw the things that people were saying behind closed doors and I'm like, how? Like things like even like just the lying about mm -hmm. like things that I would say. And I'm like, how is this even possible? Like I spent the two, like two weeks that I was in there, I spent it like cooking them breakfast, mm -hmm. making them crack up with jokes. Like mm -hmm. I was like so confused. And like some of the things that were being said were so malicious and so wrong and so like grotesque. And I grew so bitter because, you know, everyone keeps blaming that the reason I went home is because I vocalized that I wanted to target the men in the mm -hmm. house, which is, you know, whatever. You go in with a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and men want to target women all the time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. And especially the queer community. Mm -hmm. So um, I made it an effort to vocalize like I didn't care who heard, but I'm glad I said that because the idea to backdoor me took place like days before I even said anything. Mm -hmm. Days. Mm -hmm. Like I can pinpoint literally based on what people were wearing. I'm like, this was like day three. This is like day three. Like I haven't even been unpacked yet. Mm -hmm. And you're already talking about like by episode two, seven people in my cast already labeled me as a target and they wanted me to go home. Mm -hmm. Day two. I'm like, <laughs> how, like, how could you not feel like it was like through prejudice? How could you not feel that they looked at you because you were different, mm -hmm. that they felt these things, right? And it's it was just so weird and awful. And and that's when I started accepting like the, the anger that I felt, the bitterness that I felt, because I wanted to hide it. Like I didn't I didn't know that for a long time I, I didn't. I, I wasn't acting on my anger and, yeah. and not that I want people to be like, oh, aggressive. And like, I just mean like, you know, every every one of your emotions are valid and mm -hmm. every one of your emotions need to like feel you need to yeah. feel them out. So when you're angry, be angry, like allow yourself to just, you know, be that. And I'm not saying to, you know, res 
resolve into like physical altercations, mm -hmm. none of that. I'm just saying, you know, feel the way that you feel. And I was suppressing all of those things because again, it's this idea that I have to be a good boy. I yeah, have to be yeah. this, I have to be that. And it's like, no, I am angry about this. So then as I accepted those feelings, that's when the journey of like recovery for me really began. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh wow, okay, like, wow, it did feel like, there was some validation in feeling like loneliness in that house and feeling like it wasn't just that I was being backdoored and all these things. And, you know, it it was up and down, side to side. Like one day I'd be like on top of the world. And then the next day I was like, oh man, like I'm so down on myself for some reason. And no one, no one to this day has ever come up to me and said like, you were awful on TV, you mm -hmm. were this. I'm always received by love. I'm always received by so much support and they're all, it always starts off with, I loved you on TV. I wish you were there more. Screw those guys that went after you. And that's it. Yeah. But for some reason, I still felt like people were coming down on me and it was like, where is this all coming from? So thankfully I did do um, therapy. I went through mm -hmm. the therapy. I went through the mental health journey, which I always like I'm like an advocate for like mental health now. Yes. like oh my goodness like therapy go do it like yeah. I if you if you don't think you need it you probably need you it. you severely <laughs> need it and I relate to so many of the things you said especially I've never heard anyone articulate it this way before when you said you were oblivious and used to being mistreated and I'm like oh this connects back to, this is not just a reality tv thing this yeah. connects back to so many things and how you were saying you're used to being a good boy how you're saying you're used to not feeling your anger and I think yeah. that that's another part of the Asian and North American experience that yes. people and I think even frankly Asians in North America don't realize that's happening where it's like oh we're we feel like we need to uphold like this, uh, these values that right. come from our home countries, but then that can sometimes put us in compromised positions here. And I, so I filmed my show two years ago. It'll almost be two years since the finale of my show airing. I also have gone on the mental health journey. People know I've like written about it and talked about it, have been in therapy for years. And a few weeks ago, I was speaking to somebody who is like an elder Filipino. They're not like elder. They're just like a few years older than yeah. me. And they were on a reality show. And we were just, you know, catching up because we're Kababayan. So yeah, we automatically have the built-in like, bond. It, the, the beauty about mm. Filipino culture mm. is like you could be whoever. I notice you You tell me you're Filipino. Oh, We're, we're just like, we're it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Like, we trust each other. <laughs> literally. In. Literally. So she said something to me that I... I it really, I don't know, it just was something that I never thought to allow to even happen in my mind where she said, I know you're ne you've are you never said this, at least in press or anything, you've never said this because I know you are a good person, but I'm going to like validate for this for you and I'm going to say this for you. When I watched the show, I saw how mean people were being to you. And I, I want you to know that like I saw it. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, time to go to therapy again. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I was like, holy it, shit, it, I forgot. It, it takes someone else to like, yeah. I just like, so like, I think you and I are the same in this way where like we just choose to just look at things so optimistically. Mm -hmm. But like it can be actually like there's like this term like where it's like optimistically like toxic. And yeah. I, we have like our levels of toxicity, you know, yeah. especially me. Little... I'm an Aries. Um, <laughs> but um that is like that optimism can sometimes really cloud like the things that you were seeing because even in the house like I when I reflect on it now and like when I was vocalizing my concerns about being backdoored I was being told to like shut up mm -hmm. and like you know believe in what people are saying and I'm like don't tell me how to feel like don't tell me how to this but like again it was this idea like oh I have to be submissive I have to like like, I have to be a good boy. I can't be, I'm, I'm being too vocal now. Mm -hmm. I'm being too, too right. Mm -hmm. And, and I shouldn't be. So I had to listen to these people. So I like silenced my voice a little bit. And like, now that I look back at it, I'm like, wow, that was messed up. Mm -hmm. Like to be told to like, you know, and it's like, who are you to tell someone how to feel um, or how to respond to something when your fight or flight is kicking in? Yeah. Like, I realize now it's like it was so invalidating to who I was in that house. And it was like, whoa, 
but I'm, I'm so blind to it, right? Yeah. Like, I still, like, in that moment, I never saw it. But now, looking back, and I'm like, I'm like, whoa. Because when I first walked out, and I was, like, again, in this, like, la-la land state, right? Mm-hmm. I walked out. I was in la-la land state. I had so many of my friends, pre-Big Brother and family, FaceTiming me, calling me, checking in on me, and being like, are you okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm like fine like I had a really good friend who came over and basically stayed with me for an entire week because he was like scared that I would like you know do something Mm -hmm. to myself like um and not that I was like vocalizing any like you know giving them any warnings of like self-harm but he was just genuinely afraid because of what he saw in on tv Mm -hmm. like what they saw was like me being bullied what they saw was me being like cornered and being lonely and crying and I'm like whoa like I did not know like I yeah it was I think it was equally as traumatizing for my close friends and yeah. family than it was for me too I think it might have been a little bit more traumatizing for them too like I you know like after everything was settled like m- my parents were even like thank god you're out of that house because it was like torture like yeah. watching them talk about you this way like and there's I think there's a there's a difference um and and you know I continuously use this as an example you know there's a difference to me being like, oh, let's get it, get rid of Erica. She's a threat versus like Erica is a cancer. Like we need to yeah. cut that out. Like I'm like, uh, what? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that's not game anymore. Well, I that's am a like, cancer astrologically. Oh. <laughs> um, but yes. <laughs> but you know, yeah. like there's a difference in 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 you saying those things, and that's just like one thing that like really sticks with me. It's like wow, like there is and and they may not know how hurtful those things you, mm-hmm. they're saying, right? And they might not be unconscious of those things, but it's triggering. It's, mm-hmm. like, awful. So so before we wrap it up, I yes. know that you've shared so much. You are still a reality TV fan. So where do you go from here after having this experience? Oh, boy. Um, I'm really hoping and praying for an All-Stars. I would ah. love to see that happen Mm -hmm. um but the likelihood of bb can doing an all-stars is like so low like i've lost hope but you know still hopeful um i would love to see myself on reality tv again i don't know like i'm really looking at anything from i think you know i'm kind of falling in love with survivor a little bit i I got i i watched um i watched season 20 it was like villains heroes versus villains heroes versus villains um and poverty Mm -hmm. queen like yeah she like stole my heart in Mm -hmm. in that season and I was like wow this looks like so much fun and now that I have someone to talk to about it I'm like you know let's let's do it but I think for now like I have been touching a lot of grass just like you know reminding myself who I was who I am and who I was before Mm -hmm. um any of this exposure any of this attention that I get and you know, I'm, I'm just making sure that if I step into the spotlight again, mm-hmm. making sure I'm doing it with grace and I'm doing it with pride and joy and like just doing something that I love. Um, maybe it comes in a form of a YouTube channel. Maybe it comes in a form of a podcast mm-hmm. or, you know, just like something fun. But right now it's about touching grass and feeling confident in who I am. And I think I've, I've found that confidence again. You know, when yeah. you when you do these things, and I'm sure even though as a winner, there were things that you felt that we were like, oh my gosh, like, you know, that kind of brought you down a couple of pegs and you still had to like kind of heal from those things. Mm-hmm. But yes, um, if I had to choose like top three rea- reality that I would love to be on, I think Survivor would be top because I feel like I can make it. I mean, there's yeah. something about being on an island and like starving yourself yeah. like that. I'm like, okay, I can deal with this. Like, imagine, I think you can. Imagine how heightened your emotions. <laughs> I mean, I was gonna, I'm saying, imagine how heightened your emotions oh, would be. Oh, I know. <laughs> there's lots of footage of me crying, okay? <laughs> and I will say, so remember who you were before all of this, but you are not going to be the same person because you have gone through this experience and you are going to be a bigger and better version, Absolutely. especially since you've chosen to heal. Absolutely. So if people want to follow you, where can they follow you? Yeah, I am on Instagram, ITS John Michael. Um, I think that's where I'm most active. Um, I read everyone's DMs in there. Um, if you want to see spicy stuff on Twitter, I'm always on there as well. But for the most part, yeah, follow me on Instagram and we'll see how the journey like kind of unfolds. Thank you so much for no, being here for and maraming salama, my kababayan. <laughs> of course.
Well, let's just say I have a few new things to talk about with my therapist after that conversation, but all in a good way. I am so grateful to anybody who is willing to be vulnerable and open up on the show. So thank you, John Michael, for sharing so much about your journey with Big Brother Canada. And I hope for anybody listening that everything we talked about or anything we talked about could be validating to you as well. Something that I always find so nice and so validating is when listeners ask me questions. So this week, I'm going to be answering a question from a listener. And the question is, what is something I love that most people don't appreciate? Okay, I'm going to pick one thing that might be a bit more, I don't know, emotional and heartfelt and another thing that's just chill. So I thought a lot about this and what is something that I really appreciate? and Over the last few years, something that I've started to do all the time that I love is whenever I see my friends, I hug them goodbye and I tell them that I love them. And I honestly love my friends so much. I have been fortunate to have friends who have stuck around for years. I have friends who I have met over the last few years and have really had my back. And I really think after going through all of the life changes I've gone through, having people who just appreciate and love and accept me as I am is just the most amazing gift. And plus, life is crazy. We don't know how long life is. We don't know what everybody else is going through, even my friends. And I just, there's just something that's so nice about giving someone a hug and telling them truly and genuinely that you love them after you spend time with them. So I love giving my friends a hug and telling them that I love them. And if you are my friend and I am hugging you and telling you that I love you, I hope you know that I mean it, okay? I'm not just dropping I love yous for no reason. But I love love t- yeah, telling my friends I love them and giving them a hug. Okay. And then the other thing that I appreciate that I don't know people appreciate that much is the crunchy parts of rice. So when you put rice in the rice cooker, maybe for a bit too long, and you get past the fluffy softness in the top in the middle, I love the bits that get a bit dark and crunchy along the edge of the rice cooker. I can mess with some crunchy rice till the end of time. And I actually used to have a roommate when I was in school. She would only eat the soft parts of rice, so it would be perfect when we'd make rice together because then I would be eating the outside and she would be eating the fluffy soft parts. So those are things that I love that maybe people don't appreciate or who knows, let me know in the comments if this is something that you appreciate. Something that I always appreciate is when people ask me a question and when people tune in to the podcast and share the podcast. So thank you everybody who has supported the podcast so far. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast wherever you get your podcast. As always, we're on Instagram and on YouTube. It's at Happy to See Me Pod. And ask me a question. So DM me, write it in the comments, and hopefully I can get to your question in a future episode. Thank you so much for spending time with me this week, and I will be happy to see you next Monday.